In today's lecture, we are going to go over the muscular anatomy of the pectoral girdle and the elbow. We are going to go over the osteology of the arm, which means that we are going to review the bones that make up the arm and the shoulder girdle, as well as the muscles which move the shoulder girdle, move the glenohumeral joint, move the elbow, and move the radial ulnar joint. This would be an anterior view of the arm. The coracoid process is on the anterior portion of the scapula. Right below the coracoid process, you would see the acupuncture points, lung one, and right below the coracoid process, you would see lung two if you are an acupuncture student. The acromion process is the flat portion of the shoulder. The humerus sits inside the glenoid fossa of the scapula, and that is considered your glenohumeral joint. So glenoid fossa articulates with the humerus, making up your glenohumeral joint. The elbow is composed of the distal humerus and the proximal ulna and radius. So this is the distal aspect of your humerus. This area is considered your arm, whereas this area would be considered your forearm. So your forearm is made up of the ulna and the radius. The humerus is considered your arm, or it can also be called your brachium. We'll see a couple of muscles that are actually going to be called brachialis, coracobrachialis, and that's indicating that it is going to be attaching somewhere on the humerus. Your elbow again, distal portion of the humerus, distal meaning further away from the trunk, whereas proximal means closer to the trunk, and it's only relative to the extremities. So when we're saying distal or proximal, we're relating it to the appendicular skeleton, which is your upper and lower extremity. So as an example, our elbow would be considered proximal to our wrist, or our wrist would be considered distal in comparison to the elbow. Our radial ulnar joint is our radius that rotates and supinates and pronates around the ulna. Your ulna is going to articulate with the humerus, making up your elbow, whereas your radius will also articulate, but primarily assist in pronation and supination. So a way to remember this is your radius is on your thumb side, so think rad for thumbs up. Your ulna is going to be in anatomical position on the pinky side. So always go back to anatomical position whenever we are trying to figure out if a structure is medial or lateral, if it is going to adduct or abduct, externally rotate or medially rotate, always refer back to anatomical position as your starting point. Some of the muscles in the shoulder girdle will include the trapezius, the rhomboids, the levator scapula, the serratus anterior, pectoralis minor, and subclavius. Just to break down some of these words if you are unfamiliar with these muscles, some of them are named after where they are located in the body, some are named after their structure, the way that they are shaped, and some are named after how large they are. So not typically in this area, these are mostly relating to what structure or what shape they are. So trapezius will be a trapezoid type of shape, rhomboid will be a rhomboidal shape, Levator scapula is going to be named after where it is located. Levator will mean to elevate, so it's going to elevate the scapula. When we say elevate the scapula, it must then be superior to the scapula, meaning that it's going to actually attach to the superior angle of the scapula, and when it contracts, it's going to elevate the scapula. It's also going to do a couple of other things since it's attaching to the transverse processes of the cervical region. So it's also going to do a little bit of lateral flexion in the cervical spine, but as far as its name, it's going to be inserting or attaching to the superior aspect of the scapula. Serratus anterior is named after its shape, so it's going to be looking like a sawtooth shape and structure. Pectoralis minor is going to attach to the anterior aspect of the body, and subclavius is named after where it is located. So sub meaning below, so when we think of a submarine, we think of it 
swimming below the water. Subclavius is going to be below the clavicle. We are going to review the deltoid, coracobrachialis, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, teres major, and the rotator cuff group. The rotator cuff group is going to include the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. These are also known as your SITS muscles, so S-I-T-S. Do not get this confused with teres major. Teres major is not part of the rotator cuff group. Teres minor is. We are going to review the deltoid and the coracobrachialis. The deltoid is actually divided into three different regions, an anterior, middle, and posterior region. It functions all as one muscle, but depending on which area we are activating, it will do a different action. So the anterior deltoid will be doing primarily shoulder flexion. Middle deltoid will be assisting in abduction or abduction. And the posterior deltoid will be doing extension. It attaches to the lateral clavicle, the acromion process, and the spine of the scapula to the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. Again, if you are an acupuncture student, there are a couple of points along the anterior acromion, posterior acromion, and around the deltoid that you will need to memorize. Um, that is not for this lecture, but it is something that you should keep in mind when palpating this muscle. On the left is the anterior view. We have the lateral portion of the clavicle, the acromion process, and the spine of the scapula. As a whole, the entire muscle is going to abduct the arm at the glenohumeral joint. The anterior deltoid, since it's attaching to the anterior portion of the body, it's going to flex the arm at the glenohumeral joint. It will also medially rotate the arm at the glenohumeral joint and horizontally flex the arm at the glenohumeral joint. The posterior deltoid is going to be attaching to the posterior aspect of the body and it will extend the arm at the glenohumeral joint, laterally rotate the arm at the glenohumeral joint, and horizontally extend the arm at the glenohumeral joint. An easy way to remember this is that any muscle that is attaching to the anterior portion of the body superior to your pelvis will most likely be doing flexion. Any muscle that is superior to your pelvis on the posterior aspect will be doing extension. So if we give an example of the rectus abdominis, it is going to flex the trunk versus your erector spinae are attaching to the posterior aspect of the body, it will extend the trunk. Once we go below the knee, it starts to become a little bit different. Your quads will extend your knee and they are attaching on the anterior portion of the body and your hamstrings will flex the knee, but anything above the pelvis in general most likely will be doing flexion. So that's one way of memorizing these muscles. If you know where it attaches, you will most likely know the action. Again, go back to anatomical position. Coracobrachialis, in its name, you can break it down into two separate regions, corico meaning the coracoid process of the scapula and brachialis meaning the humerus. So the attachments for the coracobrachialis will be the coracoid process of the scapula to the medial shaft of the humerus. It's going to flex the arm at the glenohumeral joint and adduct the arm at the glenohumeral joint. Here you can see it below the deltoid. The deltoid is superficial to the coracobrachialis. It attaches to the coracoid process to the medial shaft of the humerus. This is the palpation that we would do in class. And you can see the other videos on how to palpate those muscles in the upper extremity. We are going to go over the pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, and teres major attachments and functions. The pectoralis major is going to attach to the anterior portion of the body. It is going to attach from the medial clavicle to the sternum and the costal cartilages of ribs one through seven. 
to the lateral lip of the bicipital groove of the humerus. It's going to look like a fan shape and it's going to actually twist upon itself when it attaches to the lateral lip, similar to the levator scapula when we get to it. The pectoralis major, the actions you can think of when someone does push-ups, they are going to adduct the arms at the glenohumeral joint, medially rotate the arm at the glenohumeral joint, flex their arm at the glenohumeral joint, that's specifically referring to the clavicular head attachment, horizontally flex the arm at the glenohumeral joint and extend the arm at the glenohumeral joint, which would be the sternocostal head. Pectoralis major is a very important muscle in something that is called upper cross syndrome, which is a postural issue that people may have depending on if you sit at a computer all day, if you are texting all day, looking down, we can develop this upper cross syndrome, meaning that we are going to round our shoulders and this is going to contribute our pectoralis major to be tight, as well as other muscles. So if you are a body worker, if you are an acupuncturist or a massage therapist, you will want to open up this area. This muscle is going to be very important to open up, relax, and also start to strengthen the rhomboids. So when we hunch our shoulders forward, our rhomboids in the back, which we haven't gone over yet, are going to become overstretched. So a great exercise to have the patient do called wall angels, where you stand up against the wall, keeping your elbows and back up against the wall and try to open up your chest. There are a couple of other exercises you could do. You can do a door stretch where you bend your elbow and abduct the pectoralis muscle. So you would be doing the reverse action of what this muscle is actually intended to do. So you would try to stretch out this muscle. The latissimus dorsi, this is going to be our most superficial muscle in the lower back. Latissimus dorsi, also known as the lat, it attaches to the spinous processes of T7 through L5, the posterior sacrum and the posterior iliac crest to the medial lip of the bicipital groove of the humerus. It is going to do the handcuff position, meaning it is going to medially rotate, adduct, and extend the arm at the glenohumeral joint. It will also anteriorly tilt the pelvis at the lumbosacral joint. The trapezius is the most superficial muscle in the upper back. Latissimus dorsi, again, is the most superficial muscle in the lower back. On the left are the superficial muscles, on the right are the deeper muscles. So the levator scapula is going to be deep to the trapezius as well as the rhomboids and the rotator cuff group is also going to be deep to the trapezius and the deltoid. Here you can see a little window that is formed by the trapezius and the deltoid and the latissimus dorsi. So this window you would then see these muscles. The teres major is going to attach to the inferior angle and inferior lateral border of the scapula to the medial lip of the bicipital groove of the humerus. It will medially rotate the arm at the glenohumeral joint, adduct and extend the arm at the glenohumeral joint. Here is the teres major. Again, not one of the rotator cuff muscles. Here are the spaces that are made up of the teres minor, long head of the triceps, teres major, and the humerus. So we have the triceps hiatus, which will have the profundus brachii artery and radial nerve coming out of this space the quadrangular space, which will include the posterior circumflex humeral artery and axillary nerve. And out of the triangular space, we will have the circumflex scapular artery.
Here are the rotator cuff muscles. We have the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis, which is on the anterior. Remember again, sub meaning below, so it's below the scapula. So it's on the anterior portion of the scapula. The subscapularis will attach to the lesser tubercle, whereas the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor will attach to the greater tubercle. If you were to look at this, and this is the patient's right shoulder, if you were to put your left hand on their shoulder to palpate these structures anatomically, you would put down your ring finger, middle finger, and index finger, which would then give you the supraspinatus attachment under your ring finger, the infraspinatus attachment under your middle finger, and the teres minor attachment on your index finger. The subscapularis will be a little bit more difficult to palpate since it attaches to the lesser tubercle and you're going to have to externally rotate their arm to palpate or feel the lesser tubercle pop out. The supraspinatus is named after the fossa that it sits in. So it is going to be sitting or attaching into the supraspinous fossa. Again, remember that the spine of the scapula is here. So anytime we see supra, we think of superior to. So this is saying that this fossa is superior to the spines of the scapula. And it will attach to the greater tubercle of the humerus. Supraspinatus is the most common muscle that is injured amongst the rotator cuff muscles. And this is important to know since once you get into orthopedic testing, such as the empty can test or supraspinatus test, to test the strength of the supraspinatus. It is going to abduct or abduct the arm at the glenohumeral joint and flex the arm at the glenohumeral joint. The infraspinatus is going to be inferior to the spine of the scapula. It is going to attach to the infraspinous fossa of the scapula below the spine of the scapula to the greater tubercle of the humerus. And it's going to laterally rotate the arm at the glenohumeral joint. The teres minor is also going to be a lateral rotator. It's going to attach to the superior lateral border of the scapula to the greater tubercle of the humerus. These you can think of when someone is winding up their hand, like a pitcher at a baseball game is winding up their hand to throw a ball. That's what the teres minor and infraspinatus are doing in that motion. The subscapularis, you can think of actually throwing the ball once that ball is winded up with the teres minor and infraspinatus. The subscapularis is actually going to do the action of throwing the ball. It's going to medially or internally rotate the arm at the glenohumeral joint. And if you remember, the subscapularis attaches to the anterior portion of the body. It's going to be in the subscapular fossa on the anterior aspect of the scapula and attached to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. This would be our palpation that we would do in class. Now we are going to go to the elbow and the radial ulnar joints. In the elbow we are going to have the biceps brachii Biceps meaning by indicating two. The biceps brachii is going to have two heads or attachments, a long head and a short head. Brachialis will be deep to the biceps brachii. Brachioradialis is going to attach from the humerus to the radius, so brachioradialis. Triceps brachii will have three heads. Anconius you can think of as the little brother or sister to the triceps brachii. It's going to be doing extension at the elbow and it's going to be on the posterior aspect of the elbow. 
The radial ulnar joints are going to include pronator teres, pronator quadratus, and supinator. Pronation means to put the palm down or posteriorly rotate the palm. Again, referring anatomical position, your palm should be facing forward in anatomical position. Another way of remembering it is the supinator. So think of you are holding a bowl of soup. So to hold a bowl of soup, this would be pronation. Supination would be this. So pronation, supination. Here is the posterior view. Our triceps are here and the anconius is going to be the little brother or sister of the triceps. It's going to help in extending the elbow. We are going to go over the biceps brachii and brachialis. The biceps brachii, the long head, again it has two heads, the long head will attach to the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. The short head will attach to the coracoid process of the scapula, to the radial tuberosity. The actions of the biceps brachii, it will flex the forearm at the elbow joint, supinate the forearm at the radial ulnar joints, and flex the arm at the glenohumeral joint. This muscle is going to do more than one action because it's crossing over two different joints. So it's going to flex the arm at the shoulder joint as well as the elbow joint. And it's also going to act upon the radio ulnar joint by assisting in supination. So whenever a muscle crosses over two different joints, it will be acting upon those joints that it crosses over. The brachialis is only crossing over the elbow joint, so it's going to flex the forearm at the elbow joint. Its attachments are the distal half of the anterior shaft of the humerus to the ulnar tuberosity. The biceps brachii was attaching to the radial tuberosity. Remember that the radius rotates around the ulna, so that's where it can assist in supination. The ulnar tuberosity is where the brachialis is attaching to. The brachialis in this photo is deep to the biceps brachii. Going from left to right, the biceps brachii is on the left, attaching to the supraglenoid tubercle and the coracoid process. The brachialis is attaching distal to the humerus, and the coracobrachialis is attaching to the coracoid process to the middle of the humerus. Now we are going to go over the brachioradialis, triceps brachii, and anconius. The brachioradialis is also known as your drinking muscle. The brachioradialis is going to flex the forearm at the elbow as well as supinate or pronate depending on what its starting position is. So it's going to be known as your drinking muscle. When you pick up a cup and bring it to your mouth, that is the brachioradialis in action. It's going to attach to the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus to the styloid process of the radius. So that is where you get your brachio, the attachment on the humerus, and the radialis, the attachment on the radius. Here is the brachio radialis, the styloid process of the radius and the distal portion of the humerus. The triceps brachii will have three different attachments. It's going to have the long head attaching to the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. The lateral head and medial heads will attach to the posterior shaft of the humerus to the olecranon process of the ulna. The way that you can remember the olecranon process of the ulna is that it is the tip of your elbow. The actions will be the entire muscle will extend the forearm at the elbow and the long head will extend the arm at the glenohumeral joint. Here are the long head, lateral head, and the medial head is deep to the lateral head. The anconius, very small muscle, not often talked about. 
it is going to be doing extension of the forearm at the elbow. It attaches to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. If you don't know this yet, the lateral epicondyle will be where your forearm extensors are attaching to. Very common injury that can occur is when we are playing tennis and we develop uh, lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow when we overuse our forearm extensors. That is where our forearm extensors are attaching to the lateral epicondyle. The medial epicondyle will be where our forearm flexors are attaching to and that is where you would develop something called golfer's elbow when you are overusing the forearm flexors. The anconius will also attach to the posterior proximal ulna and again, it will extend the forearm at the elbow joint. The pronator teres, pronator quadratus, and the supinator. All of them have the actions in its name. The pronator teres will pronate the forearm at the radial ulnar joints. It will also flex the forearm at the radial ulnar joint. It will attach to the humeral head, medial epicondyle of the humerus via the common flexor tendon and the ulnar head, which will be the coronoid process of the ulna. Don't get this confused with the coracoid process of the scapula. One way of remembering this is that the coronoid process has an N in it, as does the ulna. Coracoid process has a C in it, and so does scapula. So C for scapula, coracoid process is on the scapula, N for coronoid process and an N in ulna. So the coronoid process is on the ulna to the lateral radius. Here is the pronator teres muscle. The pronator quadratus is attaching to the distal aspect of the ulna and the radius and it is going to pronate the forearm at the radio ulnar joints. The supinator, again, we are going to hold a bowl of soup. It is going to attach to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and the proximal ulna, the supinator crest, to the proximal radius. And its actions are going to supinate the forearm at the radio ulnar joints. And this would be where we would do some palpation. All right, that is everything for today. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture and I will see you next time. Thanks.